Hi, my name is Gabrielle Hayes, and I'm the co-founder of Cat Dog Fish, your first port of call for every question and concern you have about how to be a better pet parent. I'm here at Coach House Vets in Crookham Common in West Berkshire with my partner in crime, Dr. Chris Tufnell, to explore all of the, the latest and burning questions about how to care for your pet. Hi. Chris, you can introduce yourself and all the associated letters that you've worked hard to achieve and what they mean. Well, I don't think we need to go into all the letters, but oh, I, we do, we do. I became a vet uh, 19 years ago. And uh, so I've looked after dogs and cats uh, very early on in my career, and I continue to do so. And I currently look after horses. And I've also been lucky enough to be involved with the regulator of vets, which is the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, having been its president last year. Which gives you really interesting insight into lots of things that we're going to be talking about today and in our podcast series. Well, I've been really lucky to see lots of vets working all around the country, so I can certainly give some of their experiences too. Great. And I represent the voice of the pet owner. And I will also say that the we are joined... The pet owner. A, a very choosy pet owner. Exactly. Yes. We are joined in the studio today by Dizzy and Tiggy, who are Chris's two adorable uh, mixed breed doggies who are very sweet, very inquisitive. And if you hear random, random bits of noise in the background, it will no doubt be because Dizzy and Tiggy are getting up to uh, I no suspect good. we'll be joined by the cats in a minute. Too. And the cats <laughs> who hold a very special place in my heart. I am the proud owner, uh, parent of two um, rescue cats, Charlie and Henry. I adopted them when I first moved here to the UK. 10 years ago, and they are, I got them from Wood Green um, in, in outside of Cambridge, and they are wonderful. They're definitely mentally damaged, but they are wonderful. So I think we probably should cover off right at the start for listeners the fact that Gabrielle will talk about pet owners as pet parents because she comes from America, and I might slip occasionally and say pet owners, but I am coming around to pet parents. We reckon 50% of Brits now sleep with an animal on their bed, so I think we're rapidly becoming pet parents. I can't believe it's not 100%, but, you know, again, a, a minor mission of mine is to get all animals onto the bed. But <laughs> that's not necessarily our... <laughs> not great for asthmatics, necessarily. Well, they can take medicine, can't they? <laughs> I, I think I walk around with antihistamines in my back pocket because half my friends are allergic. Allergic And to I refuse cats. to cater to their particular medical needs yeah. by removing my animals. So what are we going to talk about in this first podcast? We're going to talk about vets. Um, I, I think we're going to talk about vets, the veterinary profession, what pet parents can expect when they go to a vet surgery, how they can, um, some of the questions that, that we have and might be afraid to ask when we're in the vet surgery. And listen, as pet parents, our vet is an important person to us. And so, and the vet surgery, the vet nurses. And I think it's important to understand a little bit more about what what's going on in the profession and what we should know. And, and frankly, what, what do we not need to know? What, what's, what, what's too much? I think we also have questions about what we pay for when we go into a vet surgery. And there is um, a lot of stuff that can be very expensive. And it would be good to know. And, I, and I'm dealing with it myself. I have two older cats. I am getting dinged for so much money to pay for their thyroid condition, their teeth, everything. And I do have insurance. And it's part of being a responsible pet owner, yeah, but it sure. still hurts. So let's, sure. let's no, talk a little bit about that. I think, I think it's something that we're all aware of as vets is that um, uh, veterinary fees are costly. And, and there's no doubt about that. And they do sting because apart from anything else, nobody wants them. I mean, apart from the ones that are about keeping your animal healthy and therefore keeping your dearest friend happy and, uh, and able to be a good companion, that most of them are when something goes wrong. So we're distressed about our family member being ill. And, and to compound that stress, we get a large bill from, from the vets. And, and there's, there's lots of different reasons why those bills are getting higher and higher and higher. And so it's, it's not just one simple thing. Um, and obviously, I think we're all aware of the huge advances in um, medical science and the innovations going on and, and stuff. So uh, actually, what we're doing now as vets compared to what we were doing in the 50s and 60s is is just 
completely different. We've got so much more diagnostic equipment and all of that's really expensive stuff to, to maintain. So there is a mismatch, which we can maybe sort of talk about uh, at another time, uh, between the expense of using a veterinary surgeon and actually the amount of money the vets make. Um, because at, at most of the young vets are, are really compared to other professionals who've done a five-year uh, training actually not brilliantly paid and I think that's a misconception that people have they've paid large amounts of money to a vet and they think therefore they must be wealthy and and it's just not the case the cost of delivering the services is high but actually the more important thing for me is what are you getting from a vet why why a vet and not just anybody else so a little bit of history what, what do you mean why a vet and not anybody else well why what, why what a vet? choice do i have yeah why a vet well exactly why do you not have a choice i think that's the real the real question and, and why is there no choice so a little bit of history why why just to go back to why we have a veterinary profession in the first place so right at the origins of the veterinary profession in the mid 19th century um, there were people doing a training for four weeks and then claiming that they were they were veterinarians or veterinary doctors, as they were called, mid-19th century, so in the Victorian era. So uh, back then, people recognised that there was this was a huge concern. We've got some people training for uh, uh, full veterinary degrees at places like the Royal Veterinary College. It's been around for an awful long time. And we've got some people going out there doing four weeks training saying they were vets. And some people not doing any training at all, at all and stylizing themselves as, as, as animal doctors of a sort. So the first thing that happened was the, the, the arrival of the veterinary profession, so the Royal College of, Vet, Vet, College of Veterinary Surgeons. Uh, and what the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons started doing then and continues to do now is it sets the standards for what is what, what education does somebody need before they can consider themselves to be a vet. And so what hurdle do they have to jump? And then it, it now makes sure that you keep those standards up throughout your practicing career. So that was the start of having a regulated profession. And then in 1966, the Veterinary Surgeons Act basically made it illegal for anybody other than a veterinary surgeon to diagnose or treat animal disease in the UK. So that's, that's why it's protected. We understand we've got a monopoly which gives us a, effectively a social contract. So we, we, you guys come to us knowing that you will get a service of a certain standard because we're held to account by the regulator, the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. And that's what protects animal welfare. But isn't that the same in, in human health? Well, not quite, no. So yes, you've got a regulated profession in, in doctors and, and doctors are only allowed to do certain things. But actually, uh, there's, it's much more relaxed because we can speak for ourselves. So we can say, okay. I'm really happy to go down the road and see a certain therapist, uh, however the therapist is stylized, to, to play around with my back when my back's bad. But what we're not free to do is say, I'm going to take my dog to a certain therapist just because I think they're good to play around with my dog. Because my dog can't speak up for itself and say, I don't want to do that because it may not be well, the best thing Well, we are me. free. I mean, we can go, I can, I can take my cat to an, an animal acupuncturist. I can take my cat to, I guess that's the only thing. Aren't there, there are other animal health care providers that are kind of off the grid, right? Just like yeah. they are in human health. So Absolutely. So you've got physiotherapists, you've got osteopaths, you've got a chiropractors. But under the Veterinary Surgeons Act, they have to get consent from a veterinary surgeon before they uh, undergo any treatment. And and how does a pet parent know that? Where is it signposted that that's the process I have to Well, follow? I think that's, that's one of the issues we have that in that the pet parent doesn't have that sign posted to them unless the therapist points out that that's the case. Now, now it's, it's worth thinking, because I might start to sound defensive, am I protecting a monopoly? Is it only because I actually want to do the work myself for, for my own financial because benefit? Because you are a vet. Absolutely, yeah. because I'm a veterinary surgeon. But no, the, the, the main protection, the main reason for wanting it to be so is to protect the animal. And the reason, the reason that we're so keen to protect the animal is because if, 
as a as a, a well-meaning pet owner, goodness me, I'm not criticizing any of the motivations uh, here. Everybody you wants better their, not. You just better not. No, absolutely. Everybody wants their pet to be got better as quickly as possible. And but if you then choose to go to different therapists and and receive a whole raft of different treatments we don't know whether they're going to interact badly whether that one one might be um, contraindicated in the presence of another so you might get a reaction so all of that should be orchestrated through a veterinary surgeon so we we don't say no you can't go to the therapist we're just we're just keeping tabs on 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 uh, what goes on on behalf of the animal that's what we're really interested in how do i find out more about what my options are to, to give care. And then we'll get back to, to yeah, pets. I'm sure. not trying to digress, but it is interesting to understand what the whole landscape is. We necessarily, we always just think of vets. Yeah. Uh, however, just like in human health, and there's a big interest in alternative therapies and alternative Absolutely. medicines and, and other ways to care for mental and physical illnesses. I think people are trying to apply that and want to apply that to their animals. Absolutely. For their animals. Yeah. So how do we navigate that? And and do they, like I said, do they play nicely together or are there issues between the professions? Is it very well marked or how, how would you counsel me as a pet parent? Absolutely. Well, I, I think the lines are fuzzy and I think that's, that's the problem. So no is the answer. I don't okay. think it's terribly well marked. Um, and that's why it, the, simplest thing to understand is probably that that the reason the vet wants to be involved is not because they want to take all the work in for themselves it's just they want to help you orchestrate the treatments that you have for your animals and and I should bring in another thing here which which I think is worth taking some time to think about and maybe looking up talking to others about but it's the issue of of scientific evidence and that's the fact that for us as veterinary surgeons, we want treatments and, and diagnostic techniques and um, uh, therapies to be used that have some scientific evidence behind, behind them. And that means for the ones that we use as well. And we're well aware that because it costs money to generate scientific evidence, there are things that we do that have pretty poor evidence behind them. Like what? Well, some of the drugs we use, um, say, for instance, uh, a drug that we might use in a cat um, that has maybe been licensed for use in a dog, but hasn't had the full work done in the cat. So we don't know for certain necessarily that it has exactly the same effect in a cat and, the se- and, and confers the same benefit on the cat um, that, that, that it does on the dog. Now, we work as scientists, so we look at, we extrapolate from what you've seen in a cat or even what you've seen in a human and, and say, well, if it works in those species, it's got a good chance of working because our physiology, anatomy, and all, all, all the uh, um, way we work is very similar. But we may not know that. And what we really want to do is know that. So, Our goal is to practice what's called evidence-based veterinary medicine, to make sure that when we're advising you, we're not advising you on a whim. It's not just because we believe it might work. Um, It's actually because we know it works. And that's what we're really keen keen to do. So one time, I... I rather dubiously contributed to the medical body of knowledge um, that exists because I gave my cat... I was. I had to give him a pill every day. I forget what condition he had. I think he had, this was a long time ago. I think he had hyperthyroidism and I had to give him a pill. Well, like a total idiot, I gave the cat one of my pills instead of for a condition I was treating for myself. And the cat just was like, didn't collapse, but very clearly something was wrong. And you felt so, great. I imagine it made uh, you feel no, dreadful. Like, what a jerk! I took yeah. I took the cat to the to the vet to the surgery, and they're like, "I'm sorry, what did you do?" And I told them, "There's no record in any. There's been no precedent of a cat ingesting this particular type of medication." They had to keep him in the hospital for four days, and they're like, "Well, I mean, hey, one way to look at it is." Now we're writing it up and it's going into a journal because we are studying the effect of this medicine on a cat. And I'm yeah. like, oh, I'm so grateful that I've contributed to uh, 
to uh, my poor cat. So, you're far so from alone. I, but I was a horrible. I should have gotten written up for that by the by by someone. Anyway, can but then this takes me to the question of of cynicism. So I I feel like I hear there's and I've experienced it myself and I'm not proud and it and it bothers me that I feel this but there's always a little bit of cynicism that you that you um, as a pet parent, you go in and, and the vet says, it's going to cost a thousand pounds for this. It's going to cost yeah. 400 pounds for this, 600 pounds for this. And, you know, God forbid a pet parent not be insured and you've got to pay for that out of pocket. And of course you're going to, you're going to find the money somehow, but, but damn, that's a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. There's always a little voice that says, how do I know you, Mr. Vet or doctor mm-hmm. are not, are not just trying to up your fees. And sure. And, and let's explore that a little bit, because I do think that's unfair. I, I think that um, it, it, I shouldn't feel that way. But yeah, yet yeah, it's no. a big, it's it, a big it, chunk. It's, it's perfectly understandable. And particularly as, as, let's face it, you know, it's not just veterinary fees that are, are costly in today's world. So we have a general cynicism about how we're being marketed to, sure. how people sure. are trying to sell us. So, so I think we're slightly more savvy as consumers than we were. And it's more and more difficult for people to to advertise and market to us. So they do it in a more and more subtle way. So we become more and more suspicious about how what the motives might be. Now, the first thing to say is that veterinary businesses aren't regulated. Um, they are inspected, a number of them, uh, well over 50% now um, by, by us as uh, the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons. But, but actually, it's the individual that's regulated. So it's the person in front of you that has the duty to be open, honest and straightforward about what they are uh, presenting you with. And, and the overriding motive in almost every veterinary surgeon I know is to look after that animal. Now, that might mean that the best treatment, so the approach that I've taken for years is that I tend to present the pet owner right at the start with what would I choose if I was the animal? Mm-hmm. Now, you, you may say that's anthropomorphic, but basically, does, does the animal want to wait and see whether this is going to get better? And actually, if I was sat in the animal's shoes and I've got something that has a low probability of getting better on its own, I'd probably say no. I don't want to do three more days of feeling crap so that I can um, uh, see if I can save my owner, you know, several hundred pounds in in work. I'd actually like them to find out now what's going on (laughs) so that they can get it treated now. So my first um, offer, as it were, to the uh, uh, owner is, is what would I choose if it was the owner? And I'm quite happy to say that. I'm quite happy to say this is what I think you know, your animal would choose because it wants it wants to get better soon, quickly, and you want the animal to get better quickly. Now, then the absolute correct thing to do is to tell people how much will that cost. You know, it's there's no National Health Service for Animals. We're, and I w- so wish there was. I mean, aware. when will someone come up with that? Because I'm all for it. But anyway. Uh, yeah, fantastic. But, but I mean, we are aware, aware that probably the similar treatments in the National Health Service cost five to six times what they cost in the veterinary world but because we don't see that because mm-hmm. we in this country we're not presented with it right. and we don't go to the vets and think actually goodness that's good value because if it was done to me it would be much much more yeah um, you needed a human x-ray versus a, an x-ray on your cat absolutely or a procedure in terms the of human surgery. is five times as much absolutely why yeah. it's the same machine it's the same procedure well, uh, yes, I mean, I suppose, uh, and uh, to be honest with you, I'm not sure we've drilled down and found out exactly why, but it's probably people involved. It's probably labor costs and, and infrastructure and, uh, and things like that that's tied in. Uh, but then the discussion that you can have with your veterinary surgeon is, well, that's a lot of money. And, and I'm not sure I can find that amount of money immediately or, or it's a bit much. And, and at that point... There should be a discussion to sort of cut the cloth and say, well, you know, actually, if we wait and see uh, and don't do X, Y or Z, we can um, uh, we've got a good chance 
of it getting better or and we might be able to put a, a reasonable figure on you so say eight out of ten animals would get better uh, on their own or whatever and we can make a discussion uh, have a discussion around where we're willing to compromise but we need to be understanding that we're compromising on 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 cost there so we're deciding that we're going to go for a cheaper option because we can't find the funds for whatever reason and um and therefore, we may end up with a situation in a few days' time where the animals know better. Yeah. And the reason is, is because, because we've cut corners on cost. And I think it's an important discussion to have, have with your veterinary surgeon. And if you're having that conversation, you should feel, hopefully, a level of trust in, in, that, in that process. So Yeah, but it feels like it's embarrassing, too, because you do your own, your own censorship Meaning, I say I'm embarrassed to say that money is a is an issue when we're talking about my animals' health and well-being. Yeah, I can understand that feeling completely. But but what again? I suppose you need to understand is that this is a discussion we have repeatedly with people, and these are decisions we have to make. I mean, so many uh, veterinary surgeons are pet parents too, and so we make those discussions too. We decisions too. We very often don't ensure because we think we might be able to do some of the work ourselves. And yet, these days, increasingly, there are fantastic referral and specialist centres, and this is something we should get get onto in another discussion, um, uh, where we have to send our animals too, and we we're making those decisions. So we fully understand that. So there's, there should be no embarrassment associated with that it's yeah we'd love to have all the money in the world and you know who wouldn't want to spend um everything to get their pet back into full health but even even with people's own children if if you live in a part of the world where there isn't an nhs you you have to make those decisions in terms of what you're going to spend immediately on on child health and and goodness that must be as difficult or even more difficult not more difficult. I, I think it's as difficult. <laughs> Not it's more just, difficult I don't for have you, children myself because I London. choose to devote my energies to animals. There. And all you people with kids, uh, I, can't, I, I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to say. Brilliant. <laughs> it's been great chatting about this. Thanks. Well, there's an awful lot more to talk about. And, um, and you're just going to have to come back for... Our next edition of the Cat Dog Fish podcast, where Chris and I will delve into many more philosophical and practical and and downright funny bits about being a pet parent. Thanks. Thanks, Cat. For information on how to take expert care of your pet, go to catdogfish.com.